Welcome to First Readings at Chartwell Booksellers. We're back. Uh, I hope uh, some of you were here two weeks, a week and a half ago, when we uh, uh, departed from our first reading uh, format uh, in, in that we, we, we didn't do fiction for a change. We, we, we attacked a nonfiction book, and it went quite well. Uh, that was a real departure for the series. This is a, a resumption of the original vision that we had for the series to promote new fiction. Uh, for those of you who may be here for the first time, this is a series that we inaugurated about a year ago. The idea being to promote uh, new fiction through guest readings, dramatic readings here at the store. Uh, we invited actors and actresses to come and, and, and dramatize important books that we uh, wanted to bring to a wider audience. Uh, we've been quite successful to this point. Uh, the, the readers that we've had uh, included Elizabeth McGovern, Judd Nelson, uh, Kate Nelligan, Brooke Adams, uh, Caitlin Clark. We featured uh, wonderful new books by such readers as Jane Ann Phillips, Bobby Ann Mason, Scott Spencer, Tama Janowitz, Ellen Gilchrist. Tonight we turn our attention to a, uh, a, a very special new novel by Alice McDermott called That Night. Our guest readers for this evening are uh, two very wonderful actresses, uh, Elizabeth Berridge, who's probably best known to you as uh, Stanzi, uh, Wolfgang Mozart's wife in the, the Milos Forman movie, Amadeus. She uh, also appeared recently in, um, I forget the name of the, of the program, it was uh, an adaptation of a Joyce Carol Oates novella. See, I remember the name of the author, it's the, the title sometimes throw me. Slow, slow, what was it called? Smooth Talk, that's it, Smooth Talk. It was really good. It was on Channel 13. It was also released uh, commercially. Um, Judith Ivey, who is reading with Elizabeth tonight, is one of our most versatile stage, screen, uh, even television actresses, although she appears mostly, I think, uh, in the theater, which I think is very much to her credit. She uh, has been on Broadway, it seems, almost yearly now for, for the, the, uh, the past number of years in this decade. She was most recently in a star-studded uh, revival of the Noel Coward uh, comedy, Blythe Spirit. Uh, the previous year, she was in a new American play called Precious Sons. She uh, achieved the, a, a very special double on, on, on two occasions, winning, winning both the Drama Desk and Tony Awards in the same season uh, for her Broadway debut in a play called Steaming, and then more recently in Hurley Burley by David Rabe. Uh, I'm delighted that she's here with us tonight. She's a very fine actress, and she does quite a job with this book, as you will see. Uh, Alice McDermott is also with us tonight, um, and, and I'm very, very pleased, and I welcome her. Uh, she first came to public attention, I suppose, in the literary world with her first novel, I, I believe it was in 1982. Uh, it was called The Bigamist's Daughter, and it's a very, very interesting book. Um, it's it very difficult to describe. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm not at liberty to sell it at this point. The book has gone out of print completely. I understand it will soon be back in print and paperback. Um, that's the publishing game. I, I don't understand it. We have many copies of that night for you. Uh, we have Alice McDermott for you, and I'd like to invite her up here now just to say hello and to introduce the evening. Thank you. I have many copies of A Bigamous Daughter, and if you're truly interested, <laughs> thank you very much for being here, old friends and new. Uh, I'm as interested as you are to see what this is all about. I welcome you, and I thank you very much for coming along. That night, when he came to claim her, he stood on the short lawn before her house, his knees bent, his fists driven into his thighs, and bellowed her name with such passion that even the friends who surrounded him, who had come to support him, to drag her from the house, to murder her family if they had to, let the chains they carried go limp in their hands. 
Even the men from our neighborhood in Bermuda shorts, or chinos, uh, white t-shirts and gray suit pants with baseball bats and snow shovels held before them like rifles, even they paused in their rush to protect her. The good and the bad, the black jacketed boys and the fathers in their light summer clothes startled for that one moment before the fighting began by the terrible, piercing sound of his call. This is serious, my own father remembered thinking at the moment. This is insane. I remember only that my 10-year-old heart was stopped by the beauty of it all. Cheryl was her name, but he cried, Sherry! Drawing out the word, keening it, his voice both strong and desperate. There was a history of dark nights in the sound, something lovely, something dangerous. One of the children had already begun to cry. It was high summer, the early 1960s. The sky was a bright navy above the pitched roofs and the thick suburban trees. I hesitate to say that only Venus was bright, but there it was. I had noticed it earlier when the three cars that were now in Cheryl's driveway and up on her lawn had made their first pass through our neighborhood. At a thin, rising moon, if the symbolism troubles you, but Venus was there. Across the street, a sprinkler shot weak sprays of water, white in the growing darkness. Behind the idling motors of the boys' cars, you could still hear the collective gurgle of filters and backyard pools. Cheryl's mother had already been pulled from the house, and she crouched on the grass by the front step, saying over and over again, She's not here. She's gone. The odor of their engines was like a gash across the ordinary summer air. He called her again, doubled over now, crying, I think. Then he pitched forward, his boots slipping on the grass, so it seemed for a second he'd be frustrated even in this, and once again ran toward the house. Cheryl's mother cowered. The men and the boys met awkwardly on the square lawn. Until then, I had thought all violence was swift and sure-footed, somehow sleek, even elegant. I was surprised to see how poor it really was, how laborious and hulking. I saw one of the men bend under the blow of what seemed a slow-moving chain, and then just as gracelessly swing his son's baseball bat into a teenager's ear. I saw the men and the boys leap on one another like obese, short-legged children, sliding and falling, raising chains that seemed to crumble backward onto their shoulders, moving bats and hoes and wide rakes that seemed as unwieldy as trees. There were no clever D'Artagnan mid-air meetings of <laughs> chain and snow shovel, no eye-to-eye -eye throat grippings, no witty retorts and well-timed dodges, no winners. Only in the growing darkness, a hundred dumb, unrhythmical movements, only blow after artless blow. I was standing in the road before our neighbor's house, frozen, as were all the other children scattered across the road and the sidewalk and the curbs, as if in some wide-ranging game of statues. I was certain, as were all the others, that my father would die. Behind us, one of the mothers began to call her husband's name, and then the others, touching their throats or their thighs, one by one began to follow. Their thin voices were plaintive, even angry, as if this clumsy battle were the last disappointment they would bear, or, is, or as if, it seems to me now, they had begun to echo, even take up, that lovesick boy's bitter cry. They had first appeared just after dinner. Three cars, hot rods, we were still calling them then, 
<laughs> not one of us imagining the phrase to be more than descriptive, never considering it somewhat obscene, turning onto the north end of our block, moving slowly, steadily. I had just joined my parents on the front porch. I saw my mother raise her chin to look over the wrought iron railing and the rhododendron bush as each car stopped at our corner, one waiting patiently for the next, like cars carrying beauty queens in a stalled parade. And then, just as slowly, carefully, they turned to the right. We could see they were full of teenagers. There was an impression of black leather elbows at each window, black hair, sunglasses. No radios were playing, and so only the sound of the straining, impatient motors seemed threatening, like a, a big man snoring, I thought, or a dog growling in his sleep. I can't recall at all the car's colors or their makes, a, a Chevy of some sort, no doubt, say turquoise, a sky blue, then a dark one, oh, say a, a dark green Ford with tinted windows. And the tinted windows must be true because Cheryl's boyfriend was in that second car, pressed into the back seat between two others, and none of us saw him until the cars after who knows how many slow circuits of our street suddenly turned with a sound like an explosion and drove onto her driveway and up over her lawn. The third, perhaps a white Buick with one long red stripe that ended in a pitchfork or maybe a devil's tail. My mother put her hand over her heart and looked at Cheryl's house across the street and three houses over. It was much like all the rest, brick and shingle, no front porch like ours, but four front steps and under the front window an odd hedge, dead in spots and in need of trimming. At that time, everyone in our neighborhood was painting their bricks red or white in a scattered kind of hound's tooth, a little of both. But Cheryl's house still had plain, dull, brick color bricks, and they looked somewhat dusty in comparison. And I took this as an outward sign of her household's one distinction. Cheryl's father had died the spring before. She, her mother, and her grandmother lived there alone, as everyone put it, meaning without a man in the house. Their front door was wide open that night behind the aluminum screen door, as were the front doors all up and down that side of the street on this on every warm summer evening. We could see just faintly the white stair steps beyond the door. There was a window fan, a blur in the front upstairs window. My mother put her hand to her heart and looked at the house, and I looked with her. It could not have seemed more forlorn, more unprotected. I'm sure they told him she's not there, she said. They traveled in the same order, the blue one followed by the green, then the white one with its red devil stripe or a black flourish shaped like a striking snake. The first was just at Cheryl's house, when all the engines seemed to explode and the cars, as if the road itself had suddenly leaked and tossed them into the air, were over the curb, one on Cheryl's lawn, one perpendicular to it, up over the sidewalk, the third at an odd twisted angle in her driveway. My mother grabbed my arm at the sound, pulled me even, as if, if, she, as if she would have me run, although both of us were still in our chairs. My father had jumped up, his arms raised a, a caricature of rough and ready, and the other men were already out of their homes. The car doors, the ones that faced the house, swung open and the boys slid out. They seemed eerily nonchalant. Some even stretched as if they'd simply stopped for gas in the middle of a long trip. Rick was with them, of course, and he strode unhurried across the lawn and up the three steps. He knocked, not violently, more a polite rattle at the screen door while his friends stood in loose formation by the cars, looking around and behind themselves as if they planned to stay a while. It was their calm and his, especially his, 
as he stood there at the front door waiting for someone to come. His shoulders hitched back, his fingers slipped into his rear pockets that must have kept us all at bay. And we had seen him standing there in just that way a hundred times before. We'd seen Cheryl come to the door, seen Cheryl's mother on countless Saturday nights greet him and let him in. And even those of us who knew Cheryl was gone, even those who knew why, must have considered the possibility that this was some crude and spectacular rite of hood courtship. And, and <laughs> that to interfere, to call the police, to run at this moment to her mother's aid would have been foolish, either terribly childish or terribly middle-aged. Except for the sound of the idling motors, the smell of exhaust, and the black strip of torn grass, it seemed harmless enough. I don't know when we would have noticed the chains. Rick rattled the door again and then cupped his hand to the side of his face to look inside. I thought I saw, but only faintly, Cheryl's grandmother appear on the stairs, and then her mother was behind the screen. There was some exchange of words. Cheryl's name must have been heard by the boys scattered around the lawn by the neighbors standing nearby. Rick suddenly glanced up at the house, his movements for the first time somewhat abrupt, nervous. He said something else through the screen and then quickly grabbed at it, pulling it open. He spoke again, as if the open door would give him more meaning. We saw him lean inside, his foot on the threshold. His voice grew louder, but his words were still unclear. And then in one swift movement, he pulled Cheryl's mother through the door. He was holding her forearm. I remember she wore green Bermuda shorts and, uh, and pale blue bedroom slippers. And he swung her around and off the steps, and she fell with her arms out, the dry hedge catching her hips and her legs. I don't know if she screamed, but at almost the same moment she fell, the front door slammed, the real door this time, not the screen. And Rick began to yell. Now, the men in the neighborhood were running to their garages, calling to one another with what I remember only as sounds, sounds with lots of goes and coughs and Come on, I suppose they said, let's go. My father answered in kind, barking one syllable from our porch and then rushing past us. My mother, who still had a death grip on my arm, said, go call the police. And Rick had kicked the door and then run down the steps, yelling for Cheryl. He sidestepped across the lawn, looking up to the bedroom windows to the one spinning fan. Her mother cried, she's not here. And he looked down at her, made as if to kick her, and then spinning around, called again. He was bouncing now, almost jiggling. He, he moved backward across the lawn, looking up at her house, yelling for her. You could hear the men running in the street, and you could hear the boys gathering up their chains. Rick bent as if he might fall, danced a little, and then drove his fists into his thighs. His cry rose above the idling engines, the footsteps, the hum of backyard filters and window fans, the hard sounds that passed between the running men. For just one second before the fighting began, it was the only sound to be heard. They said she had been beautiful. They said when trying to praise another girl's looks, she's as pretty as that Cheryl was. Her name giving the praise an edge of sadness and ill fate. So the listener would often reply, well, let's hope she turns out better. <laughs> so we all could come to recognize the fine, dangerous line that only pretty girls must walk. Even just recently, while watching the Miss America pageant in the white and coral-colored living room of her Florida condo, my mother had said of her favorite contestant, you know who she reminds me of? She reminds me of Cheryl. <laughs> it wasn't true, but I long ago had stopped trying to push back the tide of her praise. She was skinny, not very tall, with thin taffy-colored hair and light brown eyes. Her front teeth overlapped each other like dealt cards, and 
protruded just enough to change her lip when she held her mouth closed. Her mouth was small and seemed to hang a little too low in her round, flat face. She wore pancake makeup and black eyeliner that itself was sometimes lined with white. She dressed as all the girls who went with hoods had dressed. To school, she wore tight skirts and thin, usually sleeveless sweaters made of some material like banlon or rayon and meant to show off both her bra straps and her small breasts. She wore bangle bracelets and later Rick's silver ID bracelet and a delicate gold slave chain on her ankle under her stocking. She favored thin, transparent Woolworth scarves in bright red or pale blue and black pocketbooks shaped like small shopping bags. After school and on weekends, she traded her skirt for beige or black wranglers that she had tapered along the inseams so she would have to lie down on her bed in order to zip the fly. She kept a teasing comb in her back pocket, the two turquoise spikes of its handle pointing toward her shoulder blade. They had met sometime during that 15th summer, the summer before Cheryl went away, and the fight took place. At least they'd started dating then because they must have known or seen one another in school before that. Rick was two years older, but he'd dropped out or been suspended often enough to end up in many of Cheryl's classes. Still, it was that summer when we first saw them together. Sometime in July, it must have been, in the deeper, stiller days of the season, Cheryl came home in a car just about the time my parents and I were getting ready to go in. It was a sleek, navy blue Chevy, and with its motor running, it seemed to tremble by the curb in front of her house as if it thrilled to the significance of this event as much as she did. She let herself out, bent to say something to the driver. We had caught him just briefly as the door opened and the light went on inside, a boy in sunglasses. And then with a wave of her hand, she ran across the lawn to her door. The car tooted its horn, leaped to a start, screeched to a stop at our corner, and then tooted again as it took off down the street. On Saturday night, when the car returned and Rick got out, my mother said, oh, Cheryl has a day. And I should remind her, the next time she tells me the chosen Miss America isn't nearly as pretty as the one who looked like Cheryl, that she had said it with a kind of gratitude, as if the girl deserved it after all she'd been through, as if the boy were merely being kind. Late in that summer, just before school started, I brought my pajamas and my pillow to Diane Rossi's house. We stayed awake through most of the late show, and when we heard the car pull up outside, we turned off the television and crawled over, to the over the bed to the window. <coughs> Kneeling on our pillows, we could see them walk toward Cheryl's house. Rick had his arm across his shoulder. She held the hand he had draped there. At her steps, they kissed again. I mean, it was the first time we'd seen them kiss, but even at that age, we knew it was again. <laughs> I remember how painfully her head seemed to bend back as he leaned over her. She climbed the steps, but after she'd opened the front door, she turned and came back down again. She paused above him. He pressed his face into her chest, and she wrapped her thin arms around his head. In the yellow pool of light from her hallway, they were nearly silhouettes. Only a bit of light caught his shoe and the pale material of his shirt her white arms. Delicately, she turned her head, touching his cheek to his hair. She seemed to sigh, or with a dancer's grace, to softly lift her body and settle it down again with one breath. Then abruptly, she threw her head back, his face still pressed to her breasts, and looked straight up at the sky. Some light from a neighbor's house seemed to penetrate the fine ends of her ratted hair, seemed to touch her throat and her forehead. She bent her head again, dipped it back into the shadows, kissed his forehead and lips and throat in a kind of blessing. Turned, 
and went inside. He moved quickly once she had closed the door and again tapped his horn as he pulled away, setting someone's dog barking. Diane and I sank down into our pillows. We could feel the warm night air on our faces and we could smell the summer dust on the windowsill. We could hear her brother Billy, his summers numbered, snoring in the next room. I think we must have gone right to sleep. Cheryl called hi to me from the sidewalk in front of our house, and then to my surprise and delight, walked up our driveway. She carried a loose leaf binder and a small paperback book. There was a dark, pilly sweater thrown over her arm. This was in the early spring, four months or so before that night. It had been a warm day, perhaps the first warm day of the season, and although it was now growing cool, there was still the lingering odor of bright sunlight, the spring smell of fresh dirt. I had brought my Barbie doll out to the front porch, probably because my brother and his friends were somewhere in the house, and this was my way of showing my disdain. I had the black doll case opened at the top of the steps and was choosing a dinner outfit. <laughs> Cheryl said as she approached, How are you? As if she asked quite regularly. I must have said something like, Fine. Is this your Barbie? Yes. Nice. <laughs> she suddenly sat on the step just below mine and placed her books on her lap. I could see the initials she had written all over her loose leaf binder with black magic marker, hers and Rick's. I noticed how the ink had bled a little into the fabric. I could have been glimpsing her garter belt, her diary. The initials seemed so adult and exotic, so indicative of everything I didn't know. Turning a little, she reached back to my doll case and gently touched all the tiny dresses and skirts that were hanging there. Her fingers were thin and short and the edges of her nails pressed into her flesh as if she had only recently stopped chewing them. Then she touched the bare feet of the doll. She needs shoes. But I told her I was trying to decide which outfit to put on. Cheryl looked through the clothes again and extracted a pale blue jumper with a white frilly blouse. This is cute. I'd had something more sophisticated in mind, but I was somewhat bewildered by her presence. Did she really want to play? And so I bowed to what I thought was her better judgment. I slipped off the brown sheath the doll was wearing. Now, someday, I'll do a study What's become of that part of my generation who insisted that their Barbie dolls wear underpants and bras? And what's become of the rest of us who dressed her only in what could be seen? Uh, where's she going? Out to dinner. On a date? With her boyfriend? Yeah. At that age, I was suspicious of any adult, any teenager who too willingly joined in my imaginary games. But Cheryl was good, and there was no smirk behind her words. Well then, you want something dressier than this. She again looked through the clothes, and this time extracted a strapless red dress with a wide gold lame belt. It was the dress I had more or less planned to choose from the start. As I slipped the naked doll into it, Cheryl opened her purse and began to rummage through it. There was a sound of tumbling and clicking, plastic and glass. You have a boyfriend? I said I didn't. Not even anyone you like a little bit? I shook my head. I wasn't saying. Where's your boyfriend? She looked up from her bag and glanced toward her house. He had to go to the hospital to pick up his mother. She's been sick. She's a nutcase, but uh, now she's coming home for a while anyway, the weekend. He's got to help out. She lifted a black bag again and squinted into it. So I guess I won't see him till tomorrow or something. I understood. She was bored, friendless, without him. 
She was speaking to me merely to pass the time, maybe to keep from having to go home. I watched her extract a single cigarette and a matchbook from her bag. She looked at me cautiously, but without a word, and then lit up. I watched her draw, her chin raised. Are you going steady? I asked, although I knew. Yeah. She then lifted her arm to show me Rick's heavy ID bracelet. She turned her wrist to show me where she'd had a jeweler add an extra catch so it wouldn't slip over her hand. <laughs> the inside of her wrist was pale white, almost blue, marked with red and purple veins. She pulled the bracelet around so the nameplate rested there. We both looked at it. The name was engraved in bold, straight lines like Roman numerals. I leaned over my lap to touch it and was surprised to find it wasn't ice cold. Did he have to ask you? I said, making plans of my own. I mean, did, did, he, did you have to wait until he asked you to go steady? He had to ask me. She turned the bracelet again and then shook her wrist until it fell just so over the back of her hand but I knew he was going to. She looked at me from under her bangs. I knew it the minute I met him. Her perfume reminded me of my father's aftershave. Her eyes were rimmed with smooth black eyeliner that grew expertly, I thought, thick just over her eyeball and then quickly tapered to a fine feathery tail that ended about a quarter of an inch beyond the corner of her eye. There was a touch of white powder on her lids. How did you know? She held the cigarette between the porch step and her legs and slowly leaned back against the railing. I just know. She raised her other hand to brush the bangs from her eyes. The bracelet slid down her arm. But how? Who told you? No one told me. I just knew it. In fact, I told him. <laughs> she looked toward her house again. There were thin, short wisps of hair pulled down in front of her ears like sideburns. There was something hard and tense about the set of her jaw. She quickly raised the cigarette. I told him the very first night we met. This was marvelous to me, <laughs> that she knew, that she told him, and more, that she was here telling me. What did he say? She toyed with the corner of a paperback, flipping the pages. Well, he didn't know. See, he had a lot of girlfriends before me. He didn't think it was going to be any different. He just kind of said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she raised the chin, imitating him, then laughed again. <laughs> I was still leaning toward her, my Barbie doll all but forgotten. I don't think I'd ever been this close to Cheryl before, certainly not for this long. And I don't know which I took in more eagerly, what she said or how she looked. I remember there were a few pimples on her chin, almost buried beneath the thick makeup, a few flecks of pale pink lipstick on her small mouth. Her cigarette smoke curled toward me, and I breathed deeply. Well, we have this completely different how come? She thought for a moment and then leaned forward, pulling her books up onto her lap, her tight skirt binding her thighs. I saw the flash of her ankle bracelet under a dark stocking. Another gift from Rick, another sign of going steady. It's just different. I mean, uh, I'm not like any of those other girls. I've been through a lot of things and so I know more. She seemed to squint at me, perhaps gauging my understanding. And I'm not afraid of anything. I'm really not. I nodded. I saw that she had written their initials on the cover of her paperback as well. 
I'm not even afraid of dying. Her tone was pleasant but self-assured. She blew smoke upward into the air. They showed us movies of these car accidents in school. Didn't even bother me. Even Rick got nervous when he saw them, but I said, so what? Everybody's going to die. She looked at me carefully through the smoke and then sat back again, letting her head touch the railing. She wore a navy blue scarf around her throat. One end was thrown behind her, the other hung down in front of her bright red shell. Except for a small bruise just above her scarf, what the Maya twins had taught us to recognize as a love bite, her throat <laughs> was as white as the inside of her wrist. Pretty day she said softly, looking up at the sky. I looked too, ready to follow her anywhere. Yeah. And then still studying the sky, she told me. My father died last year. I don't know when the deaths in other people's lives stop seeming merely inevitable and start becoming a kind of embarrassment. I know that now I would greet such a statement with a quick consolation and a change of subject. But then I simply said, I know it. With her head still back, she turned and once again reached out to touch the doll dresses, the cigarette burning between her fingers. Before that, I didn't know anything. I thought that, I thought that it was stupid that people you really love could just die. I mean, I used to think that it would be better if we were all, you know, just like uh, squirrels or something, so that when people die, we wouldn't feel so terrible. She dropped her hand and slowly ran her finger along the edge of the step. I didn't know anything. Then she raised her head and looked at me. Her mouth was low in her face. There were clumps of mascara in her long lashes. Listen, if you knew everybody you loved was just going to end up disappearing, you'd probably say, why bother, right? You'd probably even stop liking people if you knew it wasn't going to make any difference or all just going to eventually disappear, right? She leaned closer. I began to understand what my mother meant when she said the girls who dress like Cheryl look tough. There was something tough even arrogant about her now. I mean, how logical is it for you to love somebody and then they just die like you never existed? I mean, how stupid would it be to keep loving someone who was dead if you were never going to see them again? What do you love then? Air? No, you don't. You don't end up loving air. She raised a cigarette again, her elbow resting on the binder. And that's why it wouldn't matter if Rick got killed or something. I mean, I guess it would be lonely, but it wouldn't be like we'd never, I'd never see him again or anything. It would be just like with me and my father. I mean, I miss him. But I know I'm going to see him again because I think about him all the time, and you, you don't keep loving someone who doesn't exist anymore. You can't just stop loving someone because they die, right? Right? Right, I said softly. I had no idea what she was talking about. I guess. She glanced down at her books ran her finger over the inked initials. The problem with Rick was that nobody loved him enough before me. If he had died, and once he was in a car accident where he might have, he wouldn't have had anyone who still cared about him. He would have just stopped being, you know, like a, like a squirrel or a cat or something. He would have been forgotten about completely. Maybe not right away, but eventually. His mother has mental problems. You know, sometimes she even forgets about him now, so what difference would it make to her if he died all of a sudden? She's in her own world. I met her once. 
And his father has too many problems to ever really think about him. His sisters, too. So if he had died before he met me, everybody would have felt bad for a little while. And then they would have just forgot about him. Pretty soon, it would have been like he'd never been born in the first place. But I wouldn't forget. We sat silently for a few minutes. My backside was growing cold against the bricks, but I didn't want to go inside. Are you getting married? I asked her. She shrugged and again looked over her shoulder to her own house before snuffing out a cigarette and tossing it onto our lawn. I guess so. She was completely, amazingly self-possessed. Completely sure. Tough. Yeah, probably we'll get married. It was clear the subject was not nearly as interesting to her as their immortality. Maybe in a couple of years. Not that it would make any difference. She glanced at me, but I failed to catch her meaning. None of that matters to us. You know, getting married, having kids, buying a house. None of that means anything to us. How come? I asked, and she smiled as if she had just proven her point. I told you. I know things. I've been through things. I know all those things that other people think are important come down to nothing. They disappear. The air had grown chillier, but it was a spring chill, without the bite of winter. Cheryl suddenly arched her back and reached up to touch the tea's crown of her hair. There were a thousand things I wanted to ask her. What movie she and Rick went to, what she said to him when he called her on the phone, when they sat together in his car, how she drew such perfect lines across her eyelids. <laughs> the death stuff amazed me but no more than all the rest. It seemed only a part, a, a profound, important, but no less puzzling part of all I would need to know in order to become a teenager. All that I feared I would somehow fail to learn. Cheryl lifted the Barbie doll from my lap, adjusted her belt and hair, turned to the doll case to find a pair of little red high heels. I wished she were my sister, and I wondered without much hope if she could somehow become my friend. She handed the doll back to me and suggested I wrap a white stole around her bare shoulders. As I buttoned the tiny fur, I said, well, I hope Rick doesn't die. Everybody's gonna die, she said quickly, and I thought for certain that I'd completely missed her point. Then she smiled, nodding slightly. But I know what you mean. <laughs> she gathered her books into her arms. I watched her walk home. The clink of his bracelet, the gold flash from her ankle, the paperback and loose leaf binder marked with their names. There was something sullen about her walk, a kind of challenge. I saw her toss her hair back over her shoulder before she pulled open the front door, armed and ready, it seemed to me to battle even the angel of death. Just a few years ago, after sodium lights had been placed on the boulevard giving the present that bright, unreal tinge that more properly belongs to nightmare or memory, and neighbors had begun to gather to form crime patrols, black and white now, although the change that had been spoken of had once meant integration as much as anything else, my parents retired and put their house on the market. I was at the end of my own marriage then, living unhappily in a similar town 10 miles away, and when winter came and the house had not yet sold, I agreed to move in so my parents could go south. In the last few years, we had learned a Bible's worth of wisdom regarding muggers and rapists and thieves, and one of the tenets of this code was never to let any house ever give the appearance of being unoccupied. 
It was necessary then, I explained to my fading husband, that I be there whenever a real estate agent brought someone through and that I keep my car in the driveway at night. I stood at the front door waiting for the real estate woman to arrive. It was February or March, one of those limp, colorless days of late winter. The lawns seemed threadbare, the hedges and trees tangled and pale white. The houses themselves persistent in their bright colors and definite stripes of aluminum siding were foolish looking without an accompaniment of snow or flowers or leaves. They seemed somehow abandoned, washed up on a desolate shore of dry yellow earth and branches the color of driftwood. Across the street, in the driveway of what had been the Rossies' house, the new people had a small boat propped up on cinder blocks and covered with pale green canvas. They had put black bars across their windows. Foolishly, we said. Things hadn't gotten that bad. Next door, the carpenters had brown burlap wrapped carefully around each of their small bushes and trees. In Cheryl's old house, the windows were all covered with thick, clear plastic that occasionally caught the dull white sky and then lost it with the next breeze, leaving only black glass. As the woman pulled into our driveway in her shiny real estate salesman car, I saw that she had the usual couple squeezed into the front seat beside her and some children in the back as well. I took this as a good sign. The ad we'd run in the Sunday paper had been headed, bring the kids. The man was the first to emerge, and he got out of the car slowly, looking, as they always do, first up at the house, then left, then to his left and right. It was a cold day, but he wore only a short leather jacket with wide lapels and designer blue jeans. There was a hand-knit muffler cast in various shades of brown and gold at his throat, and he had his fingers in his shallow pockets. He only nodded when I let him in, the real estate woman with her card and her clipboard leading the way, the children still behind them in the car. I put him in his mid-forties at first, but if I count the years more carefully, I would have to believe he was younger than that. He had dark hair and a mustache and pale, somewhat sallow skin, that abrupt, bent, furtive manner of an adult trying not to be shy. Behind him, his small wife grinned as if she were entering a party where she knew neither the host nor the guest nor why she'd been invited. She shook my hand when we were introduced and said, this is nice. There are, of course, as many different ways for a prospective buyer to look at a house as there are prospective buyers and houses. But I don't think I'd be compromising my belief in the infinite variety of human potential. The infinite variety of human potential by saying there are, in general, three or four kinds of lookers. There are the studious ones who begin in the basement, pace the dimensions of each room, try all the faucets and doors and poke their heads into the attic. The dreamy ones who walk through each room like well-behaved tourists, noticing what they are told to notice and keeping their hands to themselves. The impatient or embarrassed ones who seem to need only to confirm that there is indeed a house on the inside that more or less conforms to the house on the outside and will gladly take your word for it that there is a basement below and three bedrooms up. <laughs> and my favorites, those creative, seemingly homeless types who make the imaginative leap to ownership as soon as they walk through the door and spend their entire inspection placing their furniture, setting their table, <laughs> and so thoroughly immersing themselves in their domestic life in this home that they will discuss whether the television in the bedroom will keep the children awake on school nights before they ask how the house is heated or even its price. Rick, however, when he came through our house that day was not quite any of these. He followed the real estate agent dutifully, like a dreamer, but then would suddenly break away from her to return to the living room or to reinspect the master bedroom. 
He asked few questions, but answered most of the saleswoman's statistics with, yeah, or I know. He neither tapped the walls, nor tried the lights, nor shoved a screwdriver into the floor joists. But in every room, he went first to the windows and carefully, studiously took in the view. The saleswoman, picking up on this, said a great deal about exposure and sunlight and north winds. But it was clear this did not interest him. Later, in what had been my brother's bedroom, he stood for a good while at the front window, looking out over the driveway and the street, his arms straight at his side. He was not good looking. His dark hair was long in the back and poorly cut. His shoulders were narrow and bent. The jacket he wore was cheap. The smell of the leather overcame even the real estate woman's perfume. And he was just, as, just heavy enough around the hips to make the pockets of his jeans bulge out a little, showing the white lining. His legs were short, and he wore black socks and scuffed black shoes with silver buckles. He also wore a thin silver wedding ring, and there were dark hairs on the back of his thick fingers and hands. Watching him from the hallway just outside the room where I lingered to answer questions and keep an eye on everything in the house that a prospective buyer might pocket, I thought he seemed like an earnest, ignorant family man who was who would always be beset and besieged by money problems. Not unlike my own father, I suppose, like all the men who had lived here when I was young. He turned to me as he again looked around the room. The afternoon light through the windows only emphasized the shadows under his dark eyes. There was a small, pale scar beside his nose, and under his thin mustache, one of his front teeth was yellow. Uh, how long have you lived here, he asked me. I said, until I was 23. The saleswoman added, the house was built in 49. Across the room, his wife, who was the thorough sort, closed the closet door as if she had made up her mind about something and then announced that she was going out to check on the kids in the car. She had a narrow face and a head of thick, frosted hair. Earlier in the living room, her husband had asked her, do you think it's big enough? And she had slowly raised her eyes to the ceiling as if the room's dimensions were written on the rafters. Big enough for what? She'd said finally. And I recognized the sudden tension between them, the bitterness on her part, and on his, the long, weary effort to please. For living, he answered. <laughs> Now he put his hands in his pockets and turned to me again as she left the room. You ever know Cheryl? He asked. He motioned toward the window. She used to live over there. I nodded. Sure, I remember. And then I added, because I hadn't quite made the connection, do you know her? He pursed his lips just slightly as if to retard a smile. Yeah, he said. I dated her in high school. He said it with a bit of a swagger, and yet, coming from a man his age, the expression seemed innocent and quaint. I dated her. He looked at me carefully, his eyes dark and myopic. I dated her for over a year, he said. I smiled, failing to recall for just one moment the details of that night, because for that moment, I was embarrassed for him. He was bragging. You do know this neighborhood, then, the real estate woman said. She brushed past me into the hallway. Gray! He followed her somewhat reluctantly, but then turned. I suppose he was trying to determine how old I was, or would have been then. Were you a friend, he asked. I shook my head. Oh, she was much older, I said. Or at, at least then she was older. It wouldn't seem that way now. The woman had paused in the hallway, the clipboard to her breast. She smiled at me patiently. I mean, people who seemed much older when you were young have a way of letting you catch up with them, I went on. She held out her arm to indicate that we should head back downstairs. Don't they? Rick glanced at both of us as if we had somehow agreed to thwart him, and then turned once more 
lean into the ba to lean into the bathroom and reinspect the master where my parents had slept. Already I had begun to recall the way he had bent, driven his fists into his thighs. Already I had begun to wonder if it could be possible, if, if he had come back, not merely inadvertently found himself in a place that shocked and surprised him with its significance, but somehow planned, even manipulated this return. Downstairs, I saw him glance at the street again, at what I imagined was her house. I imagined, I understood his persistence. 